Welcome to Games from Folktales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson, and this is the final episode on the Pentamerone. Some simpler stories this time. The creatures from the version of Seven Pork Rinds here were used in Realms of Power Fairy, so there are no new stats. I like this because it's a very early, particularly successful confidence trick. Let's start with some Burtonish faux Jacopian. Seven Pork Rinds. An old woman, a beggar, giveth a good beating to her daughter for her gluttony. She haven't eaten seven pieces of pork skin, and maketh a merchant believe she had done this because she had worked too much in filling seven spindles. The merchant taketh her to wife, but she worketh not. But by the gift of three fairies, the husband, on his return from a journey, findeth the piece of cloth finished, and by another ruse of the wife, he resolveth not to allow her to work any more for fear she should fall ill. There's a woman who begs for a living and she has a daughter. She's described in particularly nasty terms because she's poor, and that means she's basically evil in these stories, which are written for the noble class. She's given seven pieces of pork lard with the skins attached and asks her daughter to boil them, while she goes off to beg for some greens from the gardeners. The smell of the pork fat is too much for the girl and she eats a rind, thinking she can pay it with blows on the shoulder from her mother. The problem for her is that, much like peanuts, who can't stop at just one, and so she finishes all seven. She knows she's going to get in trouble, so she cuts seven pieces out of an old shoe and boils those. The mother returns, adds the greens to the pot, along with the quantity of lard a coachman gave her as arms after he'd finished greasing his axles, and she puts out pieces of old bread in a wooden bowl and pours the soup over them. And when the mother eats, she knows this is not pigskin. She says to her daughter, you've done me brown, which I didn't think was a period idiom, and demands she confess, threatening to break every bone in her body. The daughter finally gets a name in this story, Saparita, and she says she was confused by the smoke of the fire and did not put leather in the soup deliberately. The woman will have none of this and attacks Saparita with a broom handle. The daughter's screams attract a passing merchant who bursts into the house, seeking to prevent whatever calamity is happening, and he says, Has she been burgling money boxes or something? This seems ridiculously extreme. And the mother needs to save face, so she gets an inspiration and says, You don't know what she's done. I'm a beggar and she's going to drive us out of house and home. By working so hard, she needs doctors and medicines. I've told her, now that it's summer, she mustn't work so hard or she'll get sick because we have so little food. She ignored me and she filled seven spindles while I was out. If she gets heart disease and is bedridden for months, then what'll I do? The merchant thinks seven spindles in a day, eh? That's some ready cash. And he says, leave off hitting her because I can see a way to fix all of her medical bills. I'll marry her and take her out of your household and then you'll be fine and I'll treat her like a princess. He then describes how wealthy he is, which gives us uh, some views of how wealth manifests to a person of the time. He says, By grace of heaven, I raise my own fowls, pigs and pigeons. You can barely move in my house for food. I have casks of corn and pitchers of oil and a cupboard full of flour. I have bladders full of lard and smoked meat hanging from the roof beams. I have a rack of crocks and heaps of wood and mounds of coal. I have safes of linen and a bed fit for a bridegroom. I'll break in here to note that the bed was often the most expensive thing a middle-class person owned. They turn up a lot in wills. He then continues, Best of all, my rents and interests let me live like a lord. I make about ten ducats a fare, and if business goes well, I'll truly be rich soon. The woman puts Saparita's hand in his and says, Here she is, live long and prosper, or words to that effect. The text notes that the business with the hands is a Neapolitan custom for its Venetian audience. Venetians do a sort of Byzantine thing, which we mistake for an Arabic thing, with veiled women and women's only spaces. It outlasts its source in Venice, I believe, much like, say, my Cypriot friend at university found when he visited Cyprus, that things there had moved on culturally and his family's customs from Australian Cypriots were considered kind of quaint. We don't get Saparita's ascent, but the choices are being beaten with a broom on the regular or a lucky dip with some random dude who seems to object to the broom business, so you can see why she might roll the dice on that one. He gets her home and says... I'm off to buy some flax, dearest, and when he comes home, he says, Don't be afraid, I'm like you, Mum. I won't break your bones for spinning. For every ten spindles, I'll give you ten kisses. And for every distaff full, I'll give you my heart. And then he needs to travel to a fair, and he'll be gone about twenty days. If she's spun a heap of flax by the time he gets back, he'll buy her a fine pair of sleeves of Russian cloth trimmed with green velvet. She tells him to pop off. It's all in hand. It's as easy as milking a black goat. That sounds weird, but he's cool with it, and he exits stage left. Saparita is a greedy girl, according to the story, but I doubt it. I think it's like those marshmallow tests for patients and children. Originally, they thought people were poor because they couldn't put off immediate gratification, 
and then later they looked at the data and found out that poor kids eat the marshmallow they can see because they don't believe the test is promised that there'll be a second marshmallow later if they leave it alone. Saparita cracks out the flour and oil and makes fritters and cakes and does precisely nothing but bake and eat for 20 days. She's worried hubby's going to come back, so she tries something kind of cool. She makes a giant spindle out of an Indian vegetable marrow, which is basically a zucchini, and then tries to drop spindle all the fabric at once off a balcony. Instead of the usual dish of water, she has a big cauldron of macaroni broth, so she has both lubricant and a snack. People wandering by think this is marvellously funny, and this attracts some fairies, and the fairies agree, so they bless the house such that all the flax gets spun and woven and whitened. Saparita thinks this is great, but she knows she can't depend on whatever magic caused this. When her husband comes home, she makes sure he finds her in bed. She's under the covers, and she has some hazelnuts about her, and as they talk, she shifts backwards and forwards on them to make cracking noises. "'You sick?' he asks. "'Couldn't be worse. I barely have a complete bone in my body,' she says. "'I'm pretty close to dead, and then my mother will starve, because you haven't paid her. Still, you got your cloth, so that's a good thing. Anyhow, I'm not doing this again.' And he feels abashed, and he says, "'Oh, your mum warned me about this. This is my bad entirely.' You hang on, I'm going to get you a doctor. Even if it costs me an eye, you'll be healthy again. And then Saparita waits for him to leave and eats the hazelnuts and then throws the shells out the window. The doctor comes and does what's usual in the period, which is checks her pulse, looks at her stool and smells her urine. These are separate containers. The chamber pot and the night vase, in case you've wondered what the guy is holding, on the cover of Art and Academe. Now you know. The famous doctor says that Saparina needs to be bled because she's not had any exercise, and the husband thinks he's a charlatan, gives him a coin called a cullion, and sends him off with curses. He's about to head off for another doctor, and Saparita says, No, the sight of you has cured me, and leaves bed. He embraces her and promises she won't have to work any more, because you can't have, and I believe this is what he means, a goddess and a woman who picks cabbages in the same form, and there's your moral. Women of quality will literally be killed by manual work, which is why it's for peasants to do. The Venetian nobles listening to this lap it up, because they are terrible people. The Three Crowns, time for some more faux Jacobean Boten. This is our last time. Oh, the sentiment. Marchetta is stolen by the wind and carried to the house of a ghoula, whence, after various accidents, receiving a buffet, she goes forth disguised in man's clothing. She wandereth to the palace of a king, where the queen becomes enamoured of her, and because... Her love meeteth with no corresponding feelings, accuseth her to her husband of having tempted her to a deed of shame. Thereupon, Marchetta is condemned to be hanged, but by virtue of a charm that had been given her by the ghoulish, she is saved, and at last becometh queen. There's a king without kids, and he's really dramatic about it. Rather than just adopting, he goes around sighing and talking about the destruction of his house. He's moaning on in the garden one night when a voice answers him from the bushes. O king, says whatever's in the shrubbery, would you prefer a daughter who'll fly away from you, or a son who'll destroy you? The king doesn't know. He wants to have a word with his advisers. He goes back to his room and rouses out his counsellors. Discourse on this entirely theoretical question in the middle of the night, he commands. Some say to go for a son, because honour before life, everyone passes away. Honour makes you remembered. Honour is glory, which never fades. Some say choose a daughter, because honour's just an idea. What makes you remembered is descendants. Life is a prerequisite to love and to wealth, and these are the practical tools for the construction of a legacy. They also point out that having a patricidal son is not very honourable, and losing a daughter by flight or lewdness isn't as much shame to a father. Team XY rallies with, you have a duty to have a son because we live in a patriarchy and you need a strong heir. Think of the welfare of the common people. And Team X says, so you think that while your son is destroying you, the realm is just going to stand around and watch. That sounds to us like a civil war. And in a civil war, it's the peasants who suffer. The king, having determined that his counsellors are not a cheat code in this game, goes to the garden and calls it again. He's decided on a girl because who wants to be murdered and have his kingdom burned down. He answers the voice and goes home. And here we note the translation. The sun invites the hours of the day to take a view of the small, ill-made folk of the Antipodes. We wonder what creatures he means. As an Australian, I take umbrage and we move on. The girl is born in the usual way and named Marchetta. She is raised with great tutors, good guards, and perfect diligence. The king thinks all of this care can undo the bad influence of her birth. The father engages his daughter off to King Picrindiskino. Picrindisk. Surely there should be another vowel. Fair enough, we'll move on. And sends her to that kingdom to marry, but on the way she's swept off by a great wind that carries her to the house of a ghoul in the dark of the forest. 
There's something here about being struck down by the plague, because he has killed Petone the infected. Petone is a version of Python, so it might relate to the death of a dragon. There's an old woman watching the place on behalf of the ghoula, and the old woman says, You're lucky the mistress is not at home. She eats nothing but people. I'm not sure why she hasn't eaten me. It might be she needs a servant. It might be I have fainting spells, heart disease, urinary tract stones, and flatulence, so she thinks I'll taste terrible. Tell you what, you do all the cleaning and I'll hide you when she comes and smuggle you food. Who knows what the future might bring if we are wise and patient. Marchetta takes the deal and makes the floors so clean you could eat macaroni off them and uses lard to polish the walnut furniture to a mirror finish. She then makes a bed and hides in a corn cask when she hears the ghoula coming and the ghoula says... Who's put the house in order? And the old woman says it was her. And the ghoul says, I find that hard to believe because the woman, who's called Pentatola, has never done any of this before. She leaves to do ghoul business, so Marchetta emerges and removes all the cobwebs and shines the copperware and soaks the laundry. The ghoul returns and praises the old woman and then goes off ghoulanting again. Ghoulanting? Yeah, dad jokes for the win. The old woman says, here's an idea. Make a dainty thing that'll suit the ghoulist taste, and I'll try to get her to promise. And wait until she swears by three crowns, or she'll still eat you. And Marchetta agrees to this and makes a feast. It's goose giblet stew and a spit roast goose stuffed with lard, garlic, and onions. She makes some priest chokers and lays a table with rose and orange leaves. A priest choker is a sort of gnocchi eaten with gravy or butter, by the way. The ghoulist arrives and wants to know who's made the feast. Her personality traits change when she eats. The old woman says, don't ask, just be happy. And the ghoul says that by the three words of Naples, she would give the cook her eyeballs. And then she swears by the three bows and arrows, she would enshine the chef in her heart. And then she swears a long oath, which I'll quote. I swear by the three candles, which are lit when a deed or will is written by night, by the three witnesses who cause a man to be hanged, by the three feet of rope that twists the man that is hanged, by the three things that chase a man from his house, stink, smoke, and a wicked woman, by the three things which wear out a house, fritters, warm bread, and macaroni, by the three women and a goose which make up a market, by the three Fs of fried fish, cold fish, and stewed fish, by the three first singers of Naples, John de Cagello, Gossip Juno, and the King of Music, by the three Ss which are needful of a lover, solitude, solicitude, and secrecy, by the three things which are needful of a merchant, credit, spirit, and fair fortune, by the three sort of folk, the whore bonds, the boasters, the beauteous youths, and the spiteful, by the three things most important to the thief, eyes to lighten well, claws to grapple well, and feet to disappear well, by the three things which are the ruin of youths, gambling, women, and taverns, by the three virtues necessary of a bailiff, sight, speed, and success, by the three things useful to a courtier, deceit, phlegm, and fortune, by the three things which are observed by a doctor, the pulse, the face, and the night vase. And Machete ignores all of this until the ghoul says, By my three crowns, if I ever know this industrious good housewife who has done me so much good service, I will do her more caresses and kindnesses than she can imagine. And so she comes out of the barrel and says, I am here. And the ghoul says, You should have kicked me because you know more than I do. You've played me, so I won't eat you. Instead, I'm going to treat you like a daughter. Here are the keys to the house. Just one thing. Don't use this last key. It opens a room in my chamber, which is just for me. Do right by me and by the three crowns. I'll make sure you have a great marriage. And Marchetta agrees, but she's curious. So when the ghoul goes out exgoulinating, she opens the door. Inside are three women asleep on thrones, arrayed in gold cloth. This story predates Bluebeard, so they're alive. They are, the narratorial voice tells us, the daughters of the ghoul. She's put them to sleep because there's a doom on them that they'll face great hardship unless a princess awakens them. Marchetta fails her sneak roll and wakes them with the sound of her shoes on the floor and the women ask for food. She bakes them eggs, which shows a practical turn of mind in a princess. This brings them back fully to wakeful life. So they go out of the house looking for fresh air and the ghoul arrives and is angry and she slaps Marchetta. And the princess responds by begging to be allowed to leave and travel the world to seek her fortune. The ghoul knows you can't get good housekeepers, so she apologises and says she won't do it again, but the princess is adamant so she's allowed to leave. The ghoul gives her a ring, and at Marchetta's request, a suit of men's clothes. The ring's magical, so if you twist it a certain way and think of the ghoul, in a moment of crisis, aid will come. The men's clothes aren't magical, but they're extremely costly, and in mythic Europe, that's almost like magic. Marchetta's heading through the woods, and she meets a king. What ho, handsome youth, says the king. Who are you? Where are you from? Where are you going? And Marchetta says she's a merchant's son, whose mother has died, He's fleeing an evil stepmother, and the king thinks that's entirely reasonable. And 
That's why a person might be hiking through the woods near nightfall in sumptuous clothes, so he offers Marchetta a job as a page. They head back to the palace, they meet the Queen, and things go badly here because the Queen immediately wants to find out what's in the new page's trousers. She struggles with her feelings for a few days, but then gives in and calls Marchetta to a private meeting, and makes a really arduous metaphor about the need of her garden to absorb Marchetta's bodily fluids, which sounds like something out of Dr. Strangelove. She then goes through a couple of other metaphors, one of which is pretty straightforward about a ship in a gulf, but the other is about how Neapolitan schoolboys were punished with the horse, which I don't understand at all. The horse is, in this case, a technique of corporal punishment, where a boy is held on the shoulders of another, but upside down, so he can be struck on the buttocks by a cane, by a third boy appointed by the teacher. I have no idea how any of this fits in. Is it a kink thing? Who knows? Then there's a sort of key and log metaphor, and the Queen begins talking about how she needs healing quickly, and a pun about how Marchetta, not being Mercury, has not a caduceus. This is all terribly clever in period, I presume, but I'm skipping it, with the exception of the way Neapolitan schoolboys are punished, because House Titalis has a lot of Neapolitan roots, and they have a gogic training regimens. Let's move on. Marchetta says no. The Queen says that when a woman of high degree is slighted, she bathes in the blood of her foe. This is not, Marchetta knows, either true or strictly sane, but she keeps that to herself. The Queen puts on the waterworks and goes to the King. What's the problem, he asks, being a guy and wanting to fix things. She answers with an extended series of unlikely examples of ingratitude and says unless he fixes it, she'll go back to her father's house. The King can't follow what she's talking about, so he asks her again. Oh, your page tried to have sex with me, she lies. The King takes a word for it and acts decisively. Marchetta finds herself tied up at the gibbet before she can get through a paragraph, which in this book is incredibly quick. She thinks that now's the time to open the matrix of leadership and twists the ring. A grave voice crashes through the air saying, let her go, she's a woman, which in hindsight isn't a great magic trick because she could have done it herself. Everyone nearby threatens their brave check and they head for the hills. Merchants leave their goods, soldiers flee their posts. Marchetta is left standing alone in the middle of an empty town. The voice is so powerful it shakes the ground and is heard in the distant palace. The king, who does not need to make a brave check because he's out of range, demands Marchetta be brought to him, and he says, Who are you really? She gives the story up to this point. Literally, it's repeated in abbreviated form in the text. Were these people paid by the minute? The king is buddies with the king of Valcanoste and knows his fiancée was whisked off by the wind, so this all sounds entirely plausible to him. The king, who, as we've noted before, is not a man of reflective pauses, has the queen dragged to the shoreline, has weights tied to her feet, and then has her pushed in the briny deeps. Oh no! However will he father an heir without a wife? Time to marry Marchetta. He sends invitations to her family to attend the wedding. The moral is that God finds a safe harbour for ships in trouble, which would be less disturbing if the author hadn't used ships as a sexual metaphor earlier. What the king of Valetacost thinks about all this business is not mentioned. He doesn't even get an invite, which is hard luck. You'd think you'd send him a save the date so he could blow you off and send whatever the medieval equivalent of a toaster is, but that doesn't happen. And there we end what started as a little subset of the Venetian material, which I hope is on the blog. Thank you for sticking with it for the year. Your saga may vary.